son, but for the session, he has come way back to his native place and where he practices, Chilapur. Thank you everyone to being connected with us and encouraging us to go ahead with the webinars. And being a weekend and late time, I request Mr. Surinarayan SR Rao to take over the session and lead. Over to you, sir. My dear friends, we are here today to understand the judgment of the Supreme Court of India rendered in civil appeal number 6659 bar 2011 in Arunachala Gounder dead by LRs versus Pannu Swami. This judgment is delivered by the Honorable Supreme Court on 20th January 2022. And uh, the judgment is delivered by a bench consisting of Justice Abdul Nazir and Krishna Murari. We have seen that this judgment is reported very widely in the press. And as lawyers, we have got to understand the correct import of the judgment by making a reference to the facts of the case to understand what the Supreme Court has decided in this particular case. Therefore, I would like to first state the facts of the case before the Supreme Court, the questions that arose for consideration before the Supreme Court, and ultimately, what is the decision given by the Supreme Court in this particular case? For this reason, I will first explain the genealogy of the family of the parties who were before the Supreme Court. Kurunata Gaunda was the prepositus. He had two sons. The first son is Marappa Gaunda, and the second son is Ramaswamy Gaunda. This Marappa Gaunda, according to the plaintiff, died on 1957. And he left behind him an only daughter by name Kupayi Amal, and his wife had predeceased him. So therefore, the only heir left behind by Marappa Gonda was Kupayi Amal. Then this Marappa Gonda had another brother by name Ramaswami Gonda. This younger brother Ramaswami Gonda had predeceased his elder brother Marappa Gonda. This Ramaswami Gonda died, leaving behind him one son by name Gurunatha Gonda and four daughters as his heirs. <coughs> the, the present uh, Kupi Amal, daughter of Marappa Gonda, died in the year 1967. So therefore, the branch of Marappa Gonda became extinct. And therefore, one of the daughters of Ramaswami Gonda, that is Tangamal, she filed a suit against her brother Gurunatha Gonda and the other three sisters for a partition and separate possession of a one-fifth share in the properties that belong to Marappa Gonda, because Kupayi Amal, daughter of Marappa Gonda, died issueless. And Gurunatha Gonda was the person who contested the claim of, uh, the, of his sister, Tangamal. So basically, it was a dispute between uh, the, the sister and a brother in respect of properties which belonged to the uncle's daughter. This was the dispute. And this Gurunatha Gonda 
contested the matter and his primary claim was that after the death of kupuyi amal in the year 1967 he was the only surviving member male member surviving male member of the joint family and by virtue of survivorship he became the absolute owner of the property he also contended that this marappa gounder the father of kupiye amal that is his uncle did not die on 14 4 as claimed by the plaintiff but he died on 11 5 so therefore the dispute primarily was whether this marappa gounder died prior to the hindu succession act or after the hindu succession act the claim of the plaintiff was that this marappa gounder died after the hindu succession act but the claim of the defendant son was he died much earlier prior to the hindu succession act 1956 number 2 the property was uh, acquired by marappa gounder by virtue of a grant made by the government so therefore the uh, claim was that it was the self acquired property of marappa gounder so therefore under uh, this suit for partition filed by tangamal was dismissed and uh, Thangamal died and subsequently her elders continued the proceedings and her son Arunachala Gounder who, who succeeded to Thangamal the plaintiff was ultimately the appellant before the Supreme Court. The, the, the trial court dismissed the suit. the madras high court also confirmed the judgment of the trial court and therefore the plaintiffs yllar represented by arunachala gounder they were before the supreme court so therefore the questions before the supreme court were whether this arunachala gounder died in 1949 or whether he died in 1957 number 2 whether the property that was the subject matter of the suit whether this property was the self acquired property of arunachala gounder or whether is it was a self acquired property of marappa gounder or whether it was the joint family property of marappa gounder and ramaswami gounder now we may make a reference to paragraph 14 of the judgment at page 8 so with regard to the date of death the supreme court came to the conclusion that marappa gounder died on 15 4 is proved and the court said that there was a finding of fact by both the courts below in regard to the date of death and therefore they would not differ from this finding of fact that is what is stated in paragraph 14 of the judgment this is what how paragraph 14 reads in so far as the date of death of marappa gounder being 15 4 it's a finding of fact affirmed by the two fact finding courts based on appreciation of material evidence existing on on the record of the case and is not liable to be interfered with and we proceed to decide the issue between the parties taking the date of death of marappa gounder as 15 4 so therefore the judgment proceeded on the basis that this marappa gounder died on 15 4 that is prior to the hindu succession act now the next question was whether the property in question was the self acquired property of marappa gounder 
or whether it was the joint family property of uh, 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 Marappa Gondar and his brother Ramaswamy Gondar. Then I, this finding is arrived at in paragraph 17 of the judgment. Furthermore, the defendants themselves have nowhere, nowhere pleaded that the purchase of the suit property was made by Marappa Gondar out of joint family funds. There is a clear admission in the written statement that the property in question was the absolute property of Parappa Gondar, he having purchased the same in, in a court auction sale. So therefore, the, the, therefore, these two findings of fact arrived at by the trial court were, were not disturbed by the Supreme Court. And, and with this, uh, uh, and with these facts having been established, the Supreme Court has said, uh, has decided, uh, has said that this was the actual issue before the Supreme Court. This is uh, uh, what is stated in paragraph 18 of the judgment. So therefore, the question that was for decision before the Supreme Court is contained in paragraph 18. In the background of the aforesaid facts, the primary issue which arises for our consideration is with respect to the right of the sole daughter to inherit the self-acquired property of her father in the absence of other legal heir having inheritable rights before the commencement of the Hindu Succession Act 1956. Therefore, Marappa Gounder, having owned a self-acquired property, died prior to the 1956 Act. He had no sons. His wife was dead. The only heritable heir, as far as Marappa Gounder was concerned, was his only daughter, Kupai Amal. So therefore, what happens to, to the property after the death of the father, when there was only daughter surviving him uh, uh, in respect of heritable rights. Then the Supreme Court has uh, <coughs> referred to large number of uh, 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 textbooks and also a few authorities and has come to the conclusion ultimately that in the absence of son, grandson and great-grandson, in the absence of a widow, the property goes to his daughter. So therefore, the, the, the qualification for a daughter to inherit the self-acquired property of the father prior to 1956 is that the father should, should not have a widow, he should have no sons, then only the property goes to the daughter. This is the sum and substance of what the Supreme Court has said by a review of all the commentators on Hindu law and also the textbooks and also the decisions uh, rendered by the Privy Council uh, and other and Madras High Court. I would make a reference to Paragraph 24 of the judgment. This is what uh, they make a reference to a Colesbrook commentary, Colesbrook's commentary on Hindu law. And this is what they say in paragraph 24. Failing male issue. Therefore, a widow takes the self-acquired property of her husband. No doubt, on failure of the male issue and a widow, these are the qualifications. On failure of the male issue and a widow, the daughter would take. So therefore, the daughter inherits the property only when there are no male issues or, uh, uh, or uh, the widow. So therefore, on the failure of these two earlier persons who, are, who would otherwise be entitled to succeed, the property would come to the daughter. Then we may make a reference to 
paragraph 38 of the 38 of the judgment they make a reference to standish grow grandi grandi's book on treatise on hindu law and this is what uh, 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 they have extracted from that book line of uh, descendant it will be seen in the course of this chapter that the hindu law of inheritance comprehends the deceased family and his near relationship via his issue that is his issue male and female his widow who takes immediately in default of the term at sons a term which includes grandsons and great grandsons on exhaustion of this line of descent the succession ascends to his parents brothers nephews grand nephews etc etc now then uh, then i may make a reference to uh, uh, paragraph uh, 38 lost portion wherein it is also affirmed that failing male issue therefore a widow takes the self acquired property of her husband no doubt on the failure of the male issue and a widow the daughter would take so therefore if there are if there is no widow if there are no sons then only the daughter would take the property then then, then this is uh, then again they refer to the uh, dharma shastra of yagnavalkya and this is what is stated in in, in the therein if a man departs this life without male issue his wife his daughter his parents his brothers the sons of his brothers and uh, and others of the same gotra and then, then kinder more remote a pupil a fellow student these succeed to the inheritance each class upon the failure of the one preceding this rule applies to all castes so therefore even according to this if there is a male issue, they take it in entirety. If there are no male issues, it goes to the widow. If the widow is not there, the property comes to the daughter. So this is, uh, uh, and then again, in paragraph 40, at page 21 of the judgment, it is, it is stated like this. In default of sons, grandsons, great grandsons and widows, this. Uh, the daughter succeed to a life estate in, in her father's property. So therefore, the same principle has been uh, affirmed in all uh, these portions of the judgment by reference to various authorities. Then they make a reference to the, a few earlier decisions uh, of the courts and also to the uh, main Hindu law. And we may strike go to paragraph 37 of the judgment. This is what is at page 30 at, uh, uh, at uh, page 37 of the judgment. This is what is stated in paragraph 43 of Mullah's principles of Hindu law as follows. The Sapindas succeed in the following order. A son, grandson, and great grandson and widow that and widow this widow is included after 14th april 1937 so in 14th april 1937 the government of uh, india brought about a new enactment called the hindu women's right to property act 1937 under this enactment both in in respect of all the provinces of India, excluding Mysore, I'll come to Mysore later, it was uh, uh, stated in this enactment that a widow would succeed to the property of a Hindu male along with the son, getting an equal share with the son. This is what the 1937 Act, which came into force, on 14th April 1937 prescribed. So therefore, after 14th April 1937, a widow would take 
uh, the property on inheritance from her husband along with her sons, the widow being given an equal share. Then on failure of the son, son, grandson or great grandson and a widow, the property would pass on uh, to the daughter. So therefore, in all these uh, uh, authorities, it is uh, stated in clear terms that a daughter would succeed to the self-acquired property of the father prior to the Hindu Succession Act 1956 only in case when there is no son, grandson or great-grandson and in the absence of a widow, the property would go to the daughter. This is uh, the first uh, uh, principle that uh, was laid down uh, by the Supreme Court. Uh, then uh, I make a reference to paragraph uh, 66 of the judgment at page 41. Right of a widow or daughter to inherit the self-acquired property or share received in partition of a corporate property of a male Hindu dying interstate is well recognized not only under the old customary Hindu law, but also by various judicial pronouncements. And thus, our answer to questions one and two are as under. If a property of a male Hindu dying interstate is self-acquired property or obtained in a partition of, uh, a, of a coparsonary or or a family property, the same would devolve by inheritance and not by survivorship. And a daughter of such a male Hindu would be entitled to inherit such property in preference to other collaterals. So therefore, she gets the properties in preference to other collaterals. So therefore, the property does not go to the father's brother or their children, the property would be inherited by the daughter in the absence of a uh, son or a widow. So this is what the Supreme Court, in the, in the case at hand, since the property in question was admittedly the self-acquired property of Marappa Gounder, despite the family being in state of jointness, upon his death interstate, his sole surviving daughter, Kupaya Amal, will inherit the same by inheritance and the property shall not devolve by survivorship. So therefore, this was the first conclusion arrived at. Therefore, under the old Hindu law, the brother Marappa's brother Ramaswamy was dead. His son Gurunatha Gondar was alive in 1967. So therefore, if the principle of survivorship was applied, the property should go to the uncle's son, Gurunath Gounder. The Supreme Court said, because the property was the self-acquired property of the father, the daughter would inherit the property, <coughs> uh, uh, inherit the property in the absence of a son and a widow, and therefore, Kupuyi Amal acquired exclusive title to the property. So therefore, and what was the estate that uh, Kupiya Mall got was, it was only a life estate. So whatever property was acquired prior to 1956 by a, by a, whim, by a female would always be a life estate. It would not be an absolute estate. So therefore, what happened was, this Kupaya Amal, though inherited the property of her father, she got only a life estate in the property. Then what happened was that this property which she acquired only a life estate, she was alive on the day when the Hindu Succession Act came into force. So therefore, by operation of Section 14.1 of the Hindu Succession Act, what happened was this limited estate 
which was held by Kupiya Mall, it blossomed into an absolute estate. And therefore, Kupiya Mall became the absolute owner of the property. So therefore, in the year 1967, when Kupiya Mall died, she died as an absolute owner of the property which was the subject matter of the soul. So therefore, when Kupuya Mall died interstate after 1967, then what should happen to her estate? She, she had no issues at all. There was a, therefore, when a Kupuya Mall died issueless, the property would, would revert to the heirs of the father as described in section 15 2 of the hindu succession act so therefore if, if we should make a reference where property is tridana property of a female and absolute property of the female where she has purchased she has got it by gift or by will or whatever it is when it is the self acquired property of the female then the property goes to her sons and daughters and her husband in the first instance, secondly upon the heirs of the husband, thirdly upon mother and father, fourthly upon the heirs of the father, and lastly upon the heirs of the mother. That is what section 15 one says. But there are two exceptions carved out in section 15.2 of the uh, Hindu Succession Act. If the property is acquired from her husband, father or mother, and if she dies issueless, the property does not go to her husband. As, uh, as per section 15, one of the act, the property would go to the heirs of the father. The property would not go to her husband. If the property is acquired, uh, 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 from her husband or mother-in-law or father-in-law, then the property would go to the heirs of uh, 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 her husband only in such a situation. This is what this is how section subsection two of section fifteen one reads. Notwithstanding anything contained in subsection one. Any property inherited by a female Hindu from her father or mother shall devolve in the absence of any son or daughter of the deceased, including the children of any predeceased son or daughter, not upon the other years referred to in subsection 1 in the order specified therein, but upon the years of the father. So therefore, Kupuyi Ammal died. She had no issues. Therefore, the property would devolve upon the heirs of her father. So the father was dead. And uh, the, her uncle, Ramaswamy Gondar, had predeceased her father. Therefore, the only heirs of her father who were dead are the five children of uh, the uncle. So therefore, that is Gurunatha Gondar, uh, the son and the four daughters of Ramaswamy Gondar, they would be jointly entitled to a share. So therefore, the Supreme Court said, by application of Section 15.2, as Kupuyi Ammal died issueless, as she had acquired this property from her father, the property would go back to the heirs of her father, and the only heirs of her father left or the children of her uncle, that is Guruna, uh, Ramaswami Gonda, and they were Gurunatha Gonda, the son of Ramaswami Gonda, and the four daughters, which included the plaintiff, that is uh, Tangamal. So therefore, the Supreme Court upheld that this Tangamal, the daughter of the uncle, was entitled to a one-fifth share. The other son and the three daughters, they were also entitled to a one-fifth share. And therefore, the Supreme Court ultimately decreed the suit, having allowed the appeal 
though the claim of the plaintiff had been rejected in both the courts both the courts below so therefore in this case see this has nothing to do with the rights of uh, daughters which is dealt with in vinita sharma's case in vinita sharma's case the supreme court has considered the effect of the 2005 amendment to section 6 of the hindu succession act what is considered in arunachal congress case is a question of succession to the self acquired property of the father where the father has not left behind a widow and a son but only a daughter so therefore no new principle is laid down with the present decision in fact the earlier law which was there which had been affirmed by a few earlier decisions of the madras high court and the previous high court or previous privy council by reference to the text of hindu law it was only upheld by the supreme court no new provision was laid down in this case no new rule was laid down in this case and the uh, this has no reference to the hindu succession act 1956 except in regard to the enlargement of the estate and succession to a hindu female who died issueless after coming into force of the hindu succession act so therefore the principle laid down in vinita sharma's case is not uh, enlarged by the decision in uh, uh, arundachala governor's case this has got to be clearly kept in mind in fact this decision also has has absolutely no application to uh, 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 to the um, to karn to world mysore because in world mysore there was there was another enactment which applied to the entire of uh, world mysore that is the 1933 act in fact the people the citizens of world mysore they were governed by the mysore hindu law women's rights act 1933 from 1933 up to 1950 56 when uh, the new hindu succession act 1956 came into force so therefore we were governed by the act and section 4 of that particular enactment itself would very clearly uh, say the order of succession in respect of the self acquired property of the family this is what the the, uh, the order of succession says in fact the order of succession reflected in old hindu law is codified in section 4 of this uh, uh, mysore act what section 4 of the mysore act says is the succession to a hindu male dying intestate shall in the first place vest in the members of the family of the prepositors mentioned below in the following order the male issue to the third generation so therefore if there is a male issue to the third generation the property goes only to the male issue in the absence of the male issues then the next in order would be the widow so if there are no male issues the widow takes the property entirely in the absence of male issues and the widow the third in succession is the daughter so therefore even according to the mysore act the daughter takes the self acquired property of the father or the property allotted to him at a partition in the absence of a son and a widow and not when they are there so therefore even under the old mysore act the daughters take the property by inheritance only when the son and widow is not there so therefore the same principle stated 
by the uh, Supreme Court in Arunachal Gounder's case would apply to Karnataka also, not because of any other decision or uh, uh, commentaries on Hindu law, but because of the enactment itself. And this section four was subject to a few decisions of the Karnataka High Court earlier. And they have made this very clear in two decisions of the Karnataka High Court. The first decision is ILR 1991-1991 Karnataka 1696. And another decision is 1982. Uh, one Karnataka law journal, page 17. In fact, I make a reference to paragraph 18 of the judgment in, I, in this ILR 1991 Karnataka. And this is what Justice uh, N.Y. Hanumantappa has stated by making a reference to section 4 and the uh, connected sections. According to me, even if section 6, 2 and 4 read with section 30 of the act are read together, by virtue of Chinnappa Madaliyar's death, the succession will be only in the order as mentioned in section 6, 2 of the act, male or female and not male and female. Secondly, order of succession shall be in case a male dies interstate. Succession is first by son who excludes the widow. If the son is dead, widow succeeds. And if both are dead, then daughter. Widow excludes daughter. And if son and widow are absent, then daughter succeeds. And this is exactly what the Supreme Court has said. The, this position has been further clarified in the case reported by this court in 1982, one Karnataka law journal, page 17. So therefore, the law, as far as the law in Karnataka is concerned, we can go back to the 1933 act, and by on the basis of the 1933 act, the property goes to the daughter only in the absence of a son and a widow, and not otherwise. So therefore, if, uh, uh, if you go to the uh, uh, various news reports made in this regard, the news reports are absolutely misleading. In fact, I would make a reference to the front page uh, uh, in uh, uh, this uh, Times of India, wherein it is stated, this is how they have reported. A bench of justice S. Sabdul Nazir and Krishna Mirari gave the judgment and said, self-acquired properties of a person who died interstate in 1949 would, de would devolve on his sole daughter, despite the man admittedly living in a joint family and could not have passed on to the deceased person's brother on the basis of survivorship law in force prior to 1956 and upon the death of his children. And uh, in the earlier paragraph, this is what he stated. The Supreme Court on Thursday conferred daughters with equal rights to father's property even prior to codification of Hindu personal law and enactment of Hindu Succession Act in 1956 and said that the law of inheritance would apply to partition of property even if the father had died interstate before 1956. So therefore, and uh, a, uh, in fact, an editorial has been written under the heading, Win for Daughters. So in fact, the, these newspapers have not focused their attention to the fact that the court gave Inheritance rights to daughter only in the absence of sons and widow. This fact has not been noticed at all in, uh, in some of the in various newspapers and also in uh, uh, various talks uh, 
uh, on the media also. Therefore, this position must be clearly kept in mind. If the facts are clearly kept in mind, then the law will be clearly uh, could be clearly understood. So, therefore, we were the court was dealing with a situation of inheritance prior to 1959. That is inheritance to a male Hindu prior to 1956 Act and succession to Hindu female in the absence of issues subsequent to 1956. So therefore, in trying to advise our clients, in trying to, uh, uh, in merely saying that daughter's rights are enhanced by this decision is not a correct conclusion. No en enlargement of rights than what was given in Vinita Sharma's case is uh, uh, made by virtue of the Arunachala Gounder's case and therefore, the principle in this decision will have got to be correctly kept in mind. Even in Vinita Sharma's case, it is very difficult to understand that judgment. The judgment runs to more than 100 pages. And there are certain uh, principles of law embodied in that decision, which is incapable of being properly comprehended by lawyers also many times. We have got to read that Vinita Sharma's case at least three or four times to understand the correct purport of the decision. So therefore, to pass what, uh, the statements made by the Supreme Court by taking out one sentence here or there would not reflect the correct law uh, enunciated by the Supreme Court. And therefore, a clarification was required in respect of this Arunachala Gounder's case. And therefore, I have uh, given this clarification. Probably I have made myself clear in uh, my exposition of this particular decision. Uh, thank you for having given me a patient hearing. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. And we are fortunate enough that we have a Sushila advocate also joined. We'll ask her expositions. Uh, she was totally glued up when you were talking. I'm trying to ask her to unmute herself. She will share her knowledge. Um, when Surana is there, uh, Surana and Rao, he's fondly called by all of us as uh, Surana. Uh, nobody else can have any other say. I have a doubt which I would like to get it clarified from Surana, sir. Rather, I would use this opportunity to get uh, myself clarified. Uh, Surana, sir, assuming for a while, <coughs> As on the date of death of Kupai Amal's mother is not mentioned here. One thing, one thing is there. The Supreme Court has said that uh, the father Marappa Gondar mm -hmm. died leaving behind an only heir. As said, so we, we have got to infer that she had predeceased her uh, uh, husband <laughs> and therefore no reference is made in the judgment. Correct. My, my question here is, I'm not on that. My question here is, assuming for a while Kupai Amal's mother was alive. Was alive, mm, yes. Then what would have been the situation? Then, as far as Madras was concerned, the 1937 Act would apply. And a widow, and a widow would succeed to the property like a son. Yes. The sons were not there. Correct. There in such a situation, mm. the widow would have succeeded to the property in entirety. And if she had the died, daughter would not have got the property at all. And if she had died before 56? Uh, before 50, the 1937 Act said, in fact, I make a reference to 1937 Act. I would uh, uh, make a reference to that particular section in this Act. This is what uh, the 1937 Act says. <clears throat> when a Hindu I make a reference to section 2. When a Hindu governed by, by any school of Hindu law, other than Dai Bhaga law, or by customary law dies, having at the time of his death an interest in Hindu joint family property, the widow shall, subject to the provisions of section 3, have in the property the same interest as 
he himself had so therefore the he will have the she will have the same uh, as he himself had that is what he, what what he stated so therefore he he himself had the entirety of the property therefore the property would go to the widow after if she had died uh, before 56 it would ah. again have come to kuppayya amal only yes, certainly certainly there is no doubt about it by after 15 because because ala if uh, she died after if she had died after 1956 the same would have been the result the ah. same would have been the result if she had died before 56 even then it wouldn't have gone, would it have gone to ramaswami gounder's children or would it have gone to his her own daughter that is the question if uh, then the, uh, then it would have gone to hmm. the lone son of uh, ramaswami gounder correct it, it would have gone to his lone son the suit would have been dismissed correct right, right, right. that's where supposing right. i was thinking devil as an advocate devil's advocate right. i was thinking right right if we had taken one contention somewhere ah. a gounder that kuppai amal's wife was alive ah 1956 ah. then the suit of the plaintiff would have been dismissed right right if, if she were really alive or anything like that ah. right 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 ah. thank But you if, if the tax situation was different things would have been different that's correct thank you thank you thank you uh mr rao there's question uh, what about the illegitimate minor daughter's right and <laughs> i have not followed your question what about the illegitimate minor daughter child's rights so see whether the daughter is minor or major it does not matter the doctor the daughter succeeds illegitimate does not make any difference illegitimate so illegitimate, illegitimate. uh that that it requires some investigation if uh, the daughter is Ill- illegitimate what would happen under the old law would be different under the new new law after if it is after 1956 if it is a um, uh, legitimate or illegitimate they are uh, classed together and they don't they do not make any difference what would happen prior to 1956 it requires some investigation okay so rao sir there was a lot of popular demand that you should be brought in from the for this purpose and you are actually what sushila ma'am was sh- sharing that once you come you can actually thread bear discuss and remove the cobwebs which are in the minds of a advocate and devil's advocate also so thank you everyone stay safe stay blessed and tomorrow we have a session by mr prabhakar who is always taking sessions his sessions are also very popular from madras and madurai bench exclusion of oral evidence by documentary evidence and its exceptions do stay connected with us tomorrow at 6:30 thank you everyone stay safe and those who have not subscribed to the channel of beyond law they can do that for the previous webinars of not only of mr rao but of also other speakers thank you everyone namaskar